we are very insecure about being African and being unapologetically so. When you grow up and decide you no longer want to live this fake life as an artificial woman, an artificial man, you don't get your testicles back. You don't get your ovaries back. You're not reproducing again. In the article, white women tried to assert that Karen was the same as the N-word. Every other minority group has always sought to exploit and hijack the black agenda for their own personal benefit. We have an ego attached to every membership we belong to except our racial membership. You cannot take a decade off and say we're not going to ask the government for nothing because we have a black president. Are you insane? Because you got black people say, well, shouldn't we vote for Trump then? Motivated and underrated, I feel elated When I touch the stage, everybody going crazy I'm hip to the game, so don't you try to play me Welcome to Yoel Sang Out Podcast. I'm your host, Yoel. We got a very special guest here today. He has a degree from Millsville University, a degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, licensed psychologist, author of Psychoacademic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys, Pan-African Activist, You've probably seen him on Breakfast Club, King Kong Consciousness. Dr. Umar, welcome, man. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Peace and Pan-Africanism to your audience. Awesome, man. So first and foremost, you know, any any kind of updates you want to put out there? Anything going on that's new? Uh, probably the most important update at this time and the most promising one is the fact that we have completed all of the major renovations at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy's elementary school. So at this point, we are waiting for an HVAC inspection. Once we get that HVAC inspection and we pass it, and I'm pretty sure we will because the company that we use is very well reputed and they did an excellent job. So once we get the HVAC inspection, we will then be looking to apply for our certificate of occupancy from the city of Wilmington's license and inspection office. Once we get that, we should then have permission to start using the building for public functions and preparing for the opening of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy for our children. Uh, we will be having a paint day for volunteers and supporters to come out, help us paint the interior of the school. We've already painted the exterior of the school about two years ago. Um, and then we're going to have a furniture day to bring in all the school furniture that we're currently uh, looking to purchase or have donated to us and we'll have a cleanup day as well to clean up the school so paint first uh clean up second and then the furniture day so depending on when we finish all this and of course this entire process four years of renovations uh five years of school hunting nine years all together it has taught me not to put any firm dates because every time I do that, they never come through. Of course, I can't help but do so because I want to see the project completed as much as possible for our children and for our donors. But if all goes well, there's a chance that we'll have the community's grand opening this Kwanzaa, December 2023. Uh, if that doesn't work, we're looking at a community grand opening of Dr. King birthday week. And worst case scenario, um, we're looking at a community grand opening the first week of Black History Month, so either December, January, or February. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And uh, for those who don't know, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first independent Black school. There's there's other types of schools, but mainly it's mainly charter schools and things that are more kind of have a relationship with the government. But this is the first independent institution that we've known of in the modern history. No, we have other independent schools. What make us unique is we're the first of those independent schools to be financed by the African diaspora. So whereas you have other independent schools, you don't have any that were funded with contributions and donations from African people in every major country in the world. We're the first one to mm. do that. And we'll be the first to be based seriously and significantly and fundamentally based off the principles of Pan-Africanism and international economics. And what I mean by that is Garveyism, Pan-Africanism, and Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism in particular will be a course 
that children will study and will have to pass in order to graduate. The philosophy and the works of Frederick Douglass will be a course that children will have to master and pass. And when it comes to economics, from investing uh, to real estate to funding uh, to business planning, all aspects of economics will be enforced strictly at FDMG Academy and taught. And because we as African people suffer so much because we have not been able to translate the black dollar into black power, our Achilles heel as a race, and particularly here in the American African context, you know, we are in the condition we are in because we do not use our money to leverage political and economic power. And so that will be a very serious focus of study at the FDMG Academy. So in those respects, we will be the first, and we may also be the first independent African school to begin in its initial stages operating in a traditional school building. Many of our independent schools, they do not operate in a traditional school building. And the ones that do, did not begin in a traditional school building. We may be the only one to operate in a traditional school building, and we may be the first to ever begin operations in a traditional school building. Most are in homes, churches, storefronts, makeshift facilities, but I don't think any of them are operating in a traditional uh, school facility. Got you. Okay. And um, so you have, I mean, this, this school is going to be kind of all inclusive. It's, it's boarding, correct? Or no, no sir. Not uh, this year. I know okay. analysis, the long-term vision and goal is for it to be a residential academy uh, for our children, but we can't afford that at this point. Uh, if I take you back a couple of years, actually nine years when we began fundraising in April of 2014, it was to purchase the HBCU St. Paul's College that had come mm -hmm. up for auction in Lawrenceville, Virginia. That was our original goal. And it was the purchase of St. Paul's that actually inspired the FDMG campaign at the time that it began. I had already made up my mind that I wanted to open up a school, but I had not yet began searching. I had not yet began fundraising. But when that HBCU presented itself uh, by way of an auction uh, through a Richmond, Virginia-based uh, auction company, that's when we jump-started the school fundraiser campaign. And we were unsuccessful. We didn't raise $2 million in time. Uh, and so the Chinese actually purchased St. Paul's. They still own it. Uh, I just ran into someone the other day who lives down there and if memory serves me correctly, they inform me that nothing has been done with the campus yet. So I don't know if the Chinese are holding it for a later date or if they're just holding it to sell it back to another investor. But I would still very much love to get my hands on that campus. Um, so if that ever comes back up for sale, we will do what we can to try to acquire it. Yeah, I mean, for foreign Chinese investors, I I lived in uh, Southern California. I have a buddy that does real estate. And he was saying how, you know, he would look for these, you know, good deals. He'd go to these open houses. And like before he could get there, there was like a foreign, like no English speaking, like from China, Chinese person that was like already purchasing it or like they were always the ones that were ahead of the game. And, you know, it's not about, you know, their their race or anything like that. It's just very interesting. And it's, you know, I'm seeing all these patterns and I believe that, even Florida made is trying to make it a rule to where you have to either be there or born there in order to, to purchase real estate or something like that. Do you know anything about that? I haven't heard that, but I would not be surprised. I wouldn't even be surprised if the federal government itself begins to step in. If they find that, you know, non Europeans are, you know, ending up acquiring too much of America's real estate, because in essence, if they get too much of it, they will ultimately own the country. Whoever owns the land owns the country, you know, which is the same issue that Africa is running into with the Chinese not being limited in what they can acquire and in places where they cannot legally acquire land, because you have a lot of African countries where if you're not an African person, you cannot own the land, or if you're not a, you know, citizen of that 
a country, you cannot own the land. So what they're doing in those cases is the Chinese are intermarrying with black women. You have a big issue in Nigeria where the Chinese are marrying black women and through their children uh, or through marriage, you know, they are becoming citizens, which will prevent their ability to acquire as much property as possible. You know, that, 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 that nothing will be able to stop that. So they're definitely, you know, in a, in, in a global land grab. And to that point, I think one of the major scams that's being run against African people right now is the uh, real estate scam. Uh, there is a global agenda, in my opinion, based on what I see as I travel the planet. There's a global agenda to strip black people of land ownership. Uh, you see it in Africa. You see it in America, uh, especially in the Caribbean. And in fact, I just came back from uh, St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, and I was in St. Thomas U.S. Virgin Islands last month, and they just passed a law uh, in the the government of the Virgin Islands. It's called the Virgin Island Derelict and Abandoned Property Act. And according to this law, an investor, which means white people, can come into the Virgin Islands, principally St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix, if they see a property that appears to be derelict or abandoned, they can rehab it without permission of the legal owner. And after it's rehabbed, they can charge the legal owner the cost of the rehabilitation. So you can be made to pay for a property being rehabbed, your property, without permission, without notice. And if you cannot pay this mystery investor the cost they paid to rehab your property, they can sell it in order to cover the cost of those renovations. In essence, they are giving people the right to steal people's properties in the Virgin Islands. And the scam is they're going to fix it up as if they're doing you a favor and charge you whatever number they want to make up in their minds. And when you can't pay it, obviously you can't because if you could, your property would already be rehabbed. They can mm -hmm. sell your property without your permission that they fixed up without your permission and collect the fee. So this is the land grab that's going on in the Virgin Islands. It is not just U.S. territory. You know, I was in Barbados recently, Aruba, uh, Bonaire, um, Curacao. Where else was I? Guadeloupe. Uh, you know, I've been to Bermuda, Bahamas, Turks and Caicos. I've been all over and you find this. Europe, Canada, you find this everywhere I go. You find this issue with black people trying to hold onto their land. They want to make us a landless race. And once we have been reduced to a landless race, we are we have effectively been placed back into slavery. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because I, I've heard the same thing as far as going back to your point about marrying in, you know, having a, a child. I've heard this happening in Ethiopia. I'm Ethiopian. Um, so I've, I mean, from the boots on the ground, I've heard of these, of these scenarios. So it's not like some crazy thing. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, Hawaii, what's going on there. I mean, I, I wanted to ask your opinion on that because we know that, um, they have weather modification technology, you know, the Chinese, they have lasers, I think now to create fires. And that was kind of going viral. I don't think a lot of those, I think a lot of those videos were doctors, but the technology's out there. We know a lot of people want whole, the Hawaii land and especially beachfront property. I think Oprah owns a lot of the uh, property out there. Um, do you suspect maybe that there's kind of something similar happening there? Like, oh, hey, natural disaster, tough, we'll help you out. But in reality, it's just like hostile takeover. I don't have any proof to my allegation, but it feels like government. I It feels like the U.S. government or one of their investors wants that land for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know what it's for. I don't know why they need it cleared out. But without question, they need that land or at least a sizable portion of that Hawaiian land space. Uh, I do not think that fire was accidental. And the fact that it has been allowed to rage for so long, you know, really, mm -hmm. really, really gives me pause towards believing that this was a true natural disaster. I believe it was created. And I think the government is in full support of that fire 
and they needed that fire in order to displace people so they can go in and do whatever it is they plan on doing. But I don't think that was uh, unintentional. I think it was very much intentional. And I believe the government's DNA is all over that scandal. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, at, at, at worst, it's what you're saying. I think at unfortunately best, you know, you have these hostile investors, 100% fact, you know, calling locals up, you know, a day after, you know, the the, the fire kind of settled down, asking to buy their property and stuff like that. I've seen stuff like that all over even mainstream news. So, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's, 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 it's a data point on top of, I think, a lot of other things that are going on. Um, I wanted to talk to you. There's a little bit about politics. The I don't know how much you're following um, kind of Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. He's a candidate. Um, he talks a lot about um, removing affirmative action. You know, his claim is, you know, affirmative action is something that um, has been a bad thing because it makes people believe that a certain demographic actually doesn't earn the position that they're in. For me, I'm like, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not a politician. I, I'm all about the whole like, you know, compete, boot, pull yourself up from the bootstraps. But obviously we got to deal with reality. Um, I'm kind of in between. I don't know which way to go. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts about that? Uh, I haven't followed him in, in particular. Um, I would argue that most tenets of affirmative action have already been eliminated. Uh, affirmative action never really benefited American African people anyway, not systemically. We have had individuals benefit from it, but as a whole, there really hasn't been much systemic benefit to American Africans. We know that white women in the LGBT community benefited way more from affirmative action than black people. And of course, because America never passes any law, particularly for American Africans, anything that even intends to look like it's supposed to be for us always ends up benefiting another group anyway. And because of our psychological homelessness and uh, racial uh, anxiety, we don't like to stand alone as a people anyway and fight for who we are. We always want to be blended in. We always want to be amalgamated into this generic uh, space or identity of being minorities or disadvantaged people or underserved Americans or people of color. You know, we, we don't like to stand up and be who we are. We are very insecure about being African and being unapologetically so. And because of that, America has been able to weaponize this uh, people of color designee to make it look like they're targeting black people for intervention when in reality, they're targeting everyone else but black people. You know, you even have cities in America who don't keep statistics on how black people are faring. You know, they keep statistics on how minorities are faring, mm -hmm. you know, so they can give an impression that black people are being taken care of when the truth of the matter is we're not because we have basically been erased by allowing ourselves to be cajoled into this people of color label. You know, so a part of that is our fault because we have never fought to be treated as a separate and or special entity when it comes to the U.S. government. We have allowed them to blend us in with all non-white groups, failing to recognize that these non-white groups are just as anti-African as Europeans are. You know, even now with all the hell that we're catching. No other race has come to um, our support, or our defense, even now. But we constantly call out Latinos. We constantly call out homosexuals. We constantly call out for Arabs and Chinese and East Indians and other people, you know, to be benefited by issues that, you know, should only really be benefiting us. You know, so we have a big, big responsibility in this anti-Black this resurgence of anti-black energy that has gripped America in the post in the post Obama era. But I would also say that everybody knows that anti-blackness is popular again in America. Uh, America is more anti-black now than she has been uh, since the 60s. You know, it kind of went underground, you know, from the 70s until Obama, you know, basically 1970 to 2010. You know, anti-blackness, you know, it kind of took a uh, a Machiavellian turn to not appear to be what it was. 
and this helped benefited America's foreign agenda so she could run around playing the moral police. But, you know, with, with Obama's election, white people threw in the towel and they said, if y'all going to put a black man in office, we're no longer going to act like we care about black people. We're going to go back to being who we've always been, anti-black Caucasians. And so they're back with a vengeance. And there's probably not an American African in this country or even African immigrant brother or sister who does not recognize this new hostility that you feel when you're around Europeans now, when you go to the restaurant, when you go to the doctor, when you're just out and about, even without conversation, the air is a whole lot more tense than it has ever been, at least in my lifetime. You know, so I definitely believe that, you know, white racism is back, you know, with a vengeance. And I kind of predicted this before Barack Obama got elected. I did say that black people would be worse off after Obama than we were before Obama. But these politicians are catering. They are catering to this anti-blackness. You're not going to get elected in America without showing white people that black people are not a priority for you. And so everyone from Trump to DeSantis to the gentleman you mentioned, Larry Elder, everyone is catering to the anti-black climate in America. Yeah, it's it's been interesting. Like I think like in before before, I think it was more of like there was more discussion maybe about it. I, I would say in mainstream media in particular, there is there's no discussion now. I mean, no I mean, discussion. I think we're playing zero. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've something that it's funny when you start talking, I've, I just recently like started thinking about, I'm like, dang, like it really has changed. And, um, it's funny, like you'll have conversations, I'll have conversations with people that are lesbian, gay, and, you know, we'll have debates on trans and all these types of topics and they'll just have their, you know, monologue of, you know, I had this issue and I was going through this and I'm like, cool, like emotional, like emotional debates don't really get me, but at the, you know, I'm respectful always. And then at the end they'll be like, well, you're, you're black. You, you, you must know how it feels. And like in that statement, I, I don't think that they understand the, like the level of condescension and the level, the, the laziness in the statement of being, essentially they're saying being trans is essentially the same thing as being black, being African, whatever it may be. Uh, can you kind of, cause you've been talking about this for a while where they're gonna use this issue as a way to kind of bypass uh, the, the black and the African issue. Um, and it's really coming to fruition like you predicted. So kind of speak on that. Absolutely, you know, well, first of all, every other minority group has always sought to exploit and hijack the black agenda for their own personal benefit. And they have been able to do that because we've never had a black agenda post Dr. King. Every agenda we have had has been multiracial. Uh, Al Sharpton's group is not exclusively focused on black people. Urban League is not exclusively focused on black people. NAACP is not exclusively focused on black people. The black church, the black masjid, they're not focused on black people. Uh, our fraternities and sororities, they're not exclusively focused on black people. Uh, even the Congressional Black Caucus rewrote their mission statement a couple years ago where they say they are no longer focused exclusively on black people. So you have to step back and ask yourself, what mainstream organization do we have that has black people as its exclusive focus, not priority, but exclusive focus, because even if you claim to prioritize black people, if you're also paying attention to the issues that are non-black, you know, we're still not getting enough of your attention because we are in a state of crisis. And when you are in a state of crisis, you should get exclusive attention, not just priority, but you should be the exclusive focus of what's going on. No black organization in America that is a major organization that is reputed, respected, and has a degree of history and a track record behind it, not one of them is exclusively dedicated to helping black people. Not a single one of them. Even our uh, civil rights attorneys, you know, who claim to be fighting for black people, many of them, and quite possibly in the interest of economics, many of them have started to take on, you know, clients who are not black. You know, so nobody, not even within our community, are black people really the exclusive focus of intervention. And, you know, these other groups who always try to make their issues look as bad as black people's, it's only to hijack our agenda, you know, for their own personal uh, purposes. And again, we've, we've always 
help them out by doing this. And I've constantly told black people, if you're going to make being gay the same as being black, you're giving them permission to prioritize their issues above our own. If you're going to make being an immigrant the same as being black, if you're going to make being physically handicapped the same as being black, if you're going to do that, you're giving people permission to hijack the black struggle for their own. You are basically stripping the exclusivity of your struggle. You are stripping it of its uniqueness, thereby diminishing the importance of it and handing that importance over to other groups. You know, so every group has sought to exploit. And you see white people doing this. You know, I, I, I saw an article not too long ago where uh, some white women were talking about being called Karen you know, which is a is a is, is a term often used to refer to a, a stereotypical white woman who's newsy, uh, minds black people's business, overly concerned with things that don't involve her. You know, trying to take control over over, over issues involving black people that are none of her business, so forth and so on. And in the article, white women tried to assert that Karen was the same as the N word. They said to call a white woman Karen was the same as to call them the N-word. That is absolutely necessary. Nowhere in American history does Karen have a history where you were beat, raped, dehumanized, forbidden to get an education, systemically lynched, incarcerated. Homosexuals were never forced into uh, uh, free labor. They were never de dehumanized. Immigrants never went through what African people went through. But when you see black people often trying to ignore slavery, see, this is why ignoring slavery has political consequences because the fact that we were enslaved, the fact that we're the only people in this country who came as imported property, not human uh, immigrants, you see, we came as imports, that is our uniqueness. You have to hold on to that. But when you hear Negroes who say, get over slavery, stop talking about it, you're literally erasing your historic claim as to why the United States government needs to treat you completely different from everyone else in the country, even other so-called disadvantaged groups. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think it's it's a combination of issues, right? Like I think some of it is pure ignorance or pure like, oh, you know, slavery, that was a long time ago. And it wasn't over that now. long. Like, why are you it wasn't yeah, it, it wasn't. Long. Not to interrupt you. No, no, you're good. Our our perception of history when it comes to African slavery has been significantly warped by European propaganda. They treat slavery like it happened a hundred years before Jesus Christ. You know, they, they treat it like it was just before Moses in the Old Testament. That's how they treat it. They push it so far back to try to give this impression that it's not relevant. My great, great, great grandfather, uh, George Washington Bailey, rest his soul, the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland. He was a Civil War veteran as well. Uh, he was also part of the Richmond campaign that led to the surrender of General Robert E. Lee. And he quite possibly was present in Galveston, Texas, when uh, Field Order Number 3 was read by uh, Gordon Granger, emancipating the enslaved Africans in Texas, which gave birth to the Juneteenth celebration. He was in all likely there because his reg all in all likelihood he was there because his regiment was assigned to be there. Um that's my great 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 grandfather. That is only one, two, three, four. You see, my dad, my grandma, my great grandma, my great great grandma. Boom, boom. That's only six generations ago. That's only yeah. six generations ago. That is not a lot of time. That is not a lot of time at all. You see, I, 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 I still regularly meet elders whose grandparents were the children of enslaved Africans, their grandparents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then depending on how old the elder is, you can still run into an elder whose parents well no it, it would still be their grandparent but who parents were sharecroppers you know it what which is you know that generation right after slavery so it's not that long ago slavery is still very much relevant today i just came across a video yesterday 
This was just yesterday where they were interviewing on film, on film, formerly mm. enslaved Africans. Of course, the interviews took place, I believe, back in the 1920s, 1930s, when television, you know, first started making its uh, making its incursion into American culture. But it was not that long ago at all, you know, and we have to understand that. And I would even argue, even if it was as long as they try to make it appear as having happened, uh, it, it, it does not erase the impact mm -hmm. that it has on America, the impact it has on American policy, the impact that it has on black psychology and the impact that it has on the black predicament. Because, you know, speaking as a psychologist, a certain set of circumstances can impact and hurt your family indefinitely and intergenerationally if it's never addressed. If it's never addressed, if the alcoholism in your family is never addressed, if the paternal abandonment is never addressed, if the suicidality is never addressed, if the poverty is never addressed, your family may continue to suffer from those same uh, debilitating issues two, three, four, 500 years into the future. We have this idea that time eliminates problems. No, it doesn't, especially not psychologically. When it comes to mental health, problems unaddressed will only get worse over time. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's look at it. Let's let me be a, a devil's advocate. Let's say there are, you know, white peoples, they had slaves and, um, you know, they're not they don't have any money, you know, they're, they're poor. Like they might be thinking like, what do you want me to do about it? Like I, I got my own problems to worry about. Um, what would you say to those types of people? We would say that we cannot fall for the individualism trap. Mm -hmm. You know, if you notice whenever America deals with issues involving, involving African people, they always like to take it to the level of individualism. That is a mm -hmm. trap. And the reason we have to stay away from arguments of individualism is slavery was systemic. When something mm. is systemic, it impacts every member of the race who was victimized and it benefits every member of the race who did the victimizing. So it doesn't matter if a white person had any slaves in their family. It doesn't matter if any of their ancestors owned slavery. It's irrelevant. Because America practiced slavery, every white person benefited from it, directly or indirectly, okay? So whether your great, great, great grandparents owned slaves or not didn't matter. They benefited from the fact that black people were considered property and not people. They benefited from the fact that their skin was pale and not black, you see, whether it came to employment, whether it came to housing, whether it came to real estate, whether it simply came to social standing. I'll give you an example. I just posted uh, a meme on my social media last night that someone sent me. And it was research that was done by this white woman where she found that white men with a felony, white men with a felony record still got more callbacks and more job interviews than black men without felonies. That mm. right there is a form of the white privilege that all white people benefit from. The education of a black man, the income of a black man, the lack of a prison record for a black man still puts them in a position where a white male who may not have the education, who may have the prison record, will still fare better. All white people benefited from slavery, whether they claim to have wanted to or not, just like today. All white people benefit from the racism black people suffer from. You may not have been the police that killed Breonna Taylor or Trayvon Martin, you understand. You may not make the policies in government that give you the privileges that you have. But guess what? You still benefit from it and you do nothing to lay to level the playing field. You know, we know that a white man with a bachelor's degree still makes more money than a black man with a doctorate. Whether you participated in the creation of that disadvantage is irrelevant. You benefit mm -hmm. from it. So that's why we can't get into the individualism trap where white people are quick to say, I didn't. 
My family didn't. My ancestors didn't. That's irrelevant. The problem was systemic, which means all black people suffer as a result of systemic racism and all white people benefit from it. And they know it. So this is not an issue of ignorance. They know they benefit from being white and you suffer from being black. But every white person has an obligation to protect white privilege. And this is why I always challenge uh, white people and black people who are sympathetic to white supremacy. I challenge them to name me a single white organization in American history that was ever formed to combat white privilege. You can't find it. You can find organizations <laughs> formed to combat police brutality, combat mass incarceration, combat homelessness, combat domestic abuse in the black community. All white agendas in the black community are designed to address symptoms. They only address symptoms. White liberals are all about black symptom management. They never address causes. Why? Because if you eliminate the problem, you eliminate your ability to eat and, and, and enrich yourself off that problem. So Caucasians are not interested in eliminating racism because if you eliminate racism, you level the playing field. We come to my area, which is psychology, right? I evaluate children as a certified school psychologist. My doctorate, as you said, clinical psychology. Let's look at the IQ test. You want to talk about white privilege? The intelligence test is one of the biggest examples of white privilege in America, okay? There's four main indexes in the modern intelligence test. There's processing speed, how fast a child can execute a task. There's working memory, how efficiently a child can multitask intellectually. There's nonverbal reasoning, how well you can solve complex problems that don't require the medium of language. Black children score just as well as whites on those three. The fourth index is the one that accounts for the 10 point test gap between blacks and whites, and that's verbal comprehension. These are the words, the ideas, the concepts, the definitions that white people use that black children have never been exposed to, have mm. nothing to do with how intelligent you are, and is largely impacted by how, how well of an education you have received. Why not take out the verbal comprehension because everybody knows it's the, it's the uh, white privilege scale of the IQ test? Why not throw it out? It doesn't matter. It doesn't measure native intelligence. It is heavily influenced by how well you've been educated. It's not really a true measure of intelligence. Why will they not do away with the verbal comprehension index of the intelligence test? Because it keeps white kids scoring higher. It keeps white kids scoring higher. Now, you can make the argument, well, if black kids just study more and read more and do this and do that, they can catch up. I absolutely agree with you. But you know what the problem with that argument is? Whenever we catch up, they move the goalposts. And for that reason, they re-standardize intelligence tests and achievement tests every 10 years. They re-standardize to do what? To readjust the black-white test gap. They move the goalposts for everything in America. As soon as black people begin to make improvements, the goalpost is moved. And so we have to recognize that, that there is no singular uh, measure of achievement in this country. And whenever black people come close to even looking like they're going to eclipse that gap that exists between them and white people, the goalpost is moved. Wow. Yeah, I've never heard you or, I mean, honestly, anybody go in depth as to why that, one, that gap exists or how the, the tests are actually set up. It's funny, whenever I think about um, how power exploits certain systems and I always think, you know, it, it's tough to make something completely, people are like, oh, the IQ test, it's unbiased, there's no social, you know, it's like even, you you have to make sure that every little piece of it is unbiased, which is almost impossible, right? You could word something a certain way where, you know, there's one word that a particular demographic just doesn't understand, is not exposed to, isn't taught, and therefore it becomes unbiased instantly right then and there. So it's interesting that you say that because I've, I've thought about that for a long time. It's interesting. Um, Okay, well, let's talk about something a little bit different. Um, have you been following kind of RFK and, and his kind of uh, RFK Jr. and his kind of uh, presidential campaign at all? Not very closely. Um, I believe I received a message from someone in his campaign 
on his campaign team. It was either him or another Democratic candidate, and they offered me an opportunity to speak with him. Uh, I didn't mm -hmm. follow up on the offer because I understand the opportunism of Democrats, of independents, of all politicians. They're constantly looking for ways to get the black vote without doing anything for it. And because of mm -hmm. my popularity within the African community here in America, you know, and of course, I'm well versed in political affairs for the most part. They would love to get someone like me to endorse. I don't think they've got the message that I don't endorse political candidates, not black ones or white ones. I might speak positively about the black ones. You know, I might even encourage them. I might even ask other brothers and sisters to consider strongly, you know, supporting them. But I do not endorse political candidates. That That is something that comes from the history of the Garvey movement. Uh, in the UNIA, the original Marcus Garvey movement founded in 1914, the log largest modern black organization in history uh, at one time anyway, uh, in, the, in the Garvey movement, they never supported political candidates. And the reason why, if you supported political, if Dr. Umar comes out for RFK, you know, if I come out for um, Cornell West or anyone else, if they end up selling the people out, my reputation, my work is automatically impacted by their mm -hmm. failure. And so one of the worst things you can do as someone who claims to represent and only represent the best interests of black people is to tie yourself to another person's agenda over which you have no control. I have no control over what Barack Obama or Cornel West or RFK does when they get in office. And one of the quickest ways to destroy your political credibility in your community is to hit your wagon to someone else's over which you have no control whatsoever. So I will never publicly uh, support a black politician. I may speak at a rally to get the word out if they're doing something positive, I will let people know that. But to officially endorse a candidate, Dr. Umar cannot afford to do that. Mm, it's fair. It's fair. But, but with um, that being said, what is his, from what you see, what are like his main one or two points that kind of separates him from anyone else running? Um, I would say his stance on the intelligence community and him being, I mean, obviously he, he knows what they had to do with, with uh, his uncle and maybe even his, his father. So I think he's, he has a vendetta uh, against them and also his, um, his skepticism, I would say, of uh, vaccines and his, uh, his, you know, really aggressive, aggressive research. And he wrote a book on Fauci. So a lot of people, ironically, on the right are more, I guess, like into him because of those things. But he is, I would say, socially democratic, whatever that means anymore. Um, but I would say that that's why he's interesting to me, probably the most out of anybody. Um, because of one of his, his experience and his, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, like perspective on the intelligence community. But I guess going from that, I, I was wondering, because what's starting to happen is they're starting to kind of slowly kind of psyop us into the, 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 the mask mandates. And I feel like we're going to have another pandemic, maybe, maybe happen, maybe not, who knows. But if something like that happens, what do you think will, I mean, now we kind of have the experience of it, but what do you think will happen at, at this, this kind of time around if it does happen again? It's going to happen again uh, because we are living in the decade of global African depopulation. That is what the 2020s are. That's why COVID hit us in 2020. They wasted no time. Uh, in March of 2020, they got or even before March, you know, but at the top of 2020, they released COVID. They are not wasting time. They want to shake down and remove as many black people as they possibly can from this planet. They have been working on global African depopulation strategies for the past 50 years. I would encourage anyone who wants to read more on this topic. There's a book by a Dr. Horowitz called Emerging Viruses. Please read the book, Emerging Viruses. There's another book by, written by Boyd Graves called State Origin. Boyd Graves was a homosexual black naval officer who contracted AIDS and decided to do research on its origin. And he found the flow chart that proved the U.S. government invented AIDS. Uh, you could mm -hmm. also 
uh, please read the 1974 Secretary of State Henry Kissinger NSSM 200 National Security Study Memorandum 200 exclusively focused on population control. And then in 1986 years later, please read Jimmy Carter's Global 2000 uh, presidential study, which is the first time that a government sought to directly involve itself in population control on a global level. Uh, a few years after Global 2000, we get the first documented cases of AIDS. This LGBT movement is not about gay pride. It's not about gay freedom. It's not about romantic choice. It is about black population control. They even reported two years ago was the first drop in black teenage pregnancy in America since the 1970s. But they claim they don't know why. We all know why. From abortion, okay, to the birth control strategies that they use, many of which are causing black women to become sterile. And of course, to the mass propagandization of same-sex relationships in the public schools. And now homosexuality and lesbianism are nothing compared to the childhood transgenderism campaign that is sweeping black America. It's so effective that the Democrats are now interested in having Dwayne Wade run for public office. Why do they want Dwayne Wade to run Whoa. for public office? Because of his son, you know, who is now legally a girl. You know, he'll be the first black man to run for public office with an open, openly transgendered child, which will go a long ways towards confusing other young black boys and girls into also self-sterilizing themselves. And I say self-sterilization because that's exactly what childhood transgenderism is. That's what the campaign is all about, to manipulate black children into eliminating their ability to reproduce. When you get gender reassignment surgery, they remove the testicles of the male. They remove the ovaries of the female. And when you grow up and decide you no longer want to live this fake life as an artificial woman, an artificial man, you decide I want to go back to my God-given gender, you don't get your testicles back. You don't get your ovaries back. You're not reproducing again. And the reason childhood transgenderism had to become more important than LGBT alone is because is because a homosexual can still reproduce. A lesbian can still reproduce. They can also decide to stop engaging in lesbian or homosexual behavior. It's a choice. But that, tra that, that transgender child who had sexual reassignment surgery, who went under the knife, they could decide they want to be a man and a woman again all they want. They will not be able to reproduce again. This is exactly why President Barack Obama was made president of America domestically to make black America safe for childhood transgenderism, to make it safe for the rainbow flag. If any other president tried to homosexualize black children, they would have been fought by black America. If any other president tried to uh, lesbianize, bisexualize or transgenderize black America, we would have pushed back because we are not historically, we are not a homosexual people. Yes, we've always had homosexuals in the black community, but they were a minority. And there was rules of etiquette that governed their conduct. They did not discuss it with children. They did not openly display it. And they were a minority in the community. All that would change once Barack Obama would leave office. And a few months before he left office, he did the ungodly. And that's by basically threatening every U.S., every State Department of Education with a loss of federal funding if they did not allow children to use the bathroom of the gender that they identify with. That was one of the last things Barack Obama did before he left office. And he waited to the last minute because I think he did anticipate some pushback. So he waited till it was time to clean out his office before he pushed that out there. But he did it. And of course, Donald Trump undid it. And then Joe Biden redid it. Now, let me say this, because you got black people say, well, shouldn't we vote for Trump then? I'm not voting for neither one. The Democratic Party plantation, nor is the Republican Party plantation, neither of them are a friend to black America. Look at what Donald Trump did for mass incarceration. Nothing. Look at what he did for black children being miseducated in the schools. Nothing. 
And let us also be reminded that Donald Trump signed more federal death warrants than any president since the time of slavery. He even signed about three of them the week, his last week in office. In fact, I think his last day in office, he signed the death execution warrant of a black man. So Donald Trump is no friend to black America. And we have to get this idea out of our head that our enemy's enemy is our friend. We don't have any friends. That's why we shouldn't be members of the Republican or the Democratic Party. Now, for purposes of primaries, I can understand you keeping your, you know, your, your, your Democratic or Republican Party, you know, card. But for purposes of winning elections, which we really can't unless we are the majority in the location where we live in our particular jurisdiction, we should be organizing black votes and leveraging them in major elections. Right. So black people are not the majority in any state in this country. So what we what we should be doing is say, let's get all the black votes in this state together. We can't win an office. We don't have enough people. But you know what we can do? We can leverage our votes. OK, and let's meet with whoever the Republican Party nominates. Let's meet with whoever the Democratic Party nominates and say, listen, we're a minority in this state. But guess what? We're still worth five million votes. We're still worth two million votes. We're still mo we're still worth you know, 20 million votes. What are you willing to give us in exchange for these 20 million votes? And we want you to know that if you fail us, if you disappoint us, the same two, 10, 20 million votes that elected you will remove you from office. That is political power. That's how you leverage political power. Let me ask you a question. How many times have black people done that? Never. Even in the civil rights struggle, we never sought to build up a black political power base. Even then, we were married to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And of course, historically, we were Republican because the Republican Party was the party that sought to limit slavery. OK, but after Franklin Delano Roosevelt ascended to the White House in the 1930s with his New Deal programs, black people saw in that something for them, although we ultimately suffered then as well because there was racism in the application and administration of those New Deal programs. But nonetheless, since 1933, we have been voting overwhelmingly Democrat, which means for the past 89 years and in another 11 years, we would have voted Democrat, overwhelmingly Democrat for a century. Can somebody please explain to me what has the Democratic Party done so great for black people that they have earned our loyalty for a century? Nothing other than Biden saying, if you ain't if you don't vote for me, you ain't black and get in office and totally ignore blacks. But here's what I want us to understand. And you know me, I'm going to hold white supremacy accountable. I'm going to hold it accountable. But at the same time, I got to hold black people accountable. Joe Biden was President Obama's vice president, was he not? So for eight yep. years, he watched black America give Barack Obama a pass. He watched black America defend Obama. He watched black America worship, literally turn that man into a second Jesus Christ, although he did nothing at all of substance for black people. Every time you saw Barack Obama talk, it was about homosexuals, it was about immigrants, it was about minorities, it was about women. Never black mm -hmm. people. Every time you saw him, he and to make sure white people didn't think he was talking about black people, he often used the word middle class because most black people are not middle class. So when you say middle class, everybody knows you're talking about white and upper elite minorities like the Asians and the East Indians. You're not talking about black people. So Barack Obama even used coded language to make sure white people knew he was not interested in helping black people. And we sat there. He's the only president in American history, the only one in American history who was never asked to do anything, held accountable or criticized by black people. And in my opinion, that also, not only does that make black America a group of hypocrites, it makes black leadership a group of hypocrites because if you are really about the benefit about the best interests of black people you can't take an eight-year break you cannot take a decade off and say we're not going to ask the government for nothing because we have a black president are you insane white power is still white whether the president is black or not you see i might be the ceo of a white corporation it's still white I might be the principal of a public school. It's still white dominated. Barack, uh, LeBron James might be the face of the Los Angeles Lakers, but the Los Angeles Lakers is still a white corporation. We are so politically ignorant that we will think a black man in the White House 
actually means that black power is in charge. Nothing could be further from the truth. And if I have any say in it, we will never have another black president again because black people are too politically immature and too religiously childlike to have a black person in a high office because it makes us believe we're winning when we're actually losing. Mm. Dang. Yeah. I think uh, we had a, a tough lesson. I think even for me, I learned a lot in the probably the past 10 years of like getting red pilled into politics and knowing what actually drives change, what actually gets politicians to act on certain things. It's like, I'd say 99% money, maybe 1% internal cause, but what got you there is probably the fact that you're willing to do whatever the powers that be decide for you to do, I assume. So what makes people think that, oh, okay, once he gets in there, then he'll he'll do the job. Like people say that about Trump and all of the things that he could have done and didn't do. Oh, you know, once he gets in there, he's just saying this, you know, once he gets in there, he's going to do this and that. And they could, they say that about, they've said that about everything, but then once well, it, remember, they get in no there. Well, remember, no one has to keep their word to us because we're disorganized. Yeah. There has never been a disorganized group of people, especially an oppressed and disorganized group of people. In world history, show me a country, show me a continent where a disorganized and oppressed group of people were ever able to hold anybody accountable. You can't because you're disorganized. This is why nobody has to worry about Black America offering consequences. We are disorganized. This is why black candidates don't keep their word. White candidates don't keep their word. Democratic candidates don't keep their word. Republican candidates don't keep their word. They don't have to because they know black people are disorganized. There is no black agenda because in order for there to truly be a black agenda, black people have to be organized to hold people accountable. Could we? Of course we could. We give the Koreans $30 billion a year in hair care. We give Nike $2 billion a year. You think you couldn't get Nike to do something positive in the black community when you're giving them $2 billion a year? Of course. You know how many corporations get more than half of their revenue from black America? We have a lot of potential political and economic power, but in order to leverage it, you have to get organized. And because black people do not have a racial ego, okay? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Except I got from a scholar elder friend of mine, Dr. Katrina Hazard, here in Philadelphia. She says black people don't have a racial ego. And she's absolutely right. There's nothing you can do to black people to piss us off enough where we will not forgive you. Now, if you disrespect my gang, I might shoot you. Disrespect my religion, I might fight you. Disrespect my fraternity, my sorority, my lodge, my neighborhood, my professional association. We have an ego attached to every membership we belong to except our racial membership. Black people do not have a racial ego. Slavery beat it out of us and religion hypnotized us against it. And so there's nothing you can do to us racially that will piss us off enough to get organized and fight back. And that is a shame because any group who can never get angry enough to take its condition seriously is a group that can be re-enslaved or exterminated. Mm. It's interesting. The, the thing that I thought about, because I obviously I grew up in America and then I recently moved to, uh, to Israel and there's a big uh, Ethiopian uh, Jewish population here. And recently there was a big protest about um, a kid, I believe he got uh, ran over and killed, unfortunately, cute kid, young kid, um, and there was no real investigation. And, you know, the Ethiopian Jewish population, they're, they're a small population, but, you know, they took to the streets, they, you know, caused the havoc, they organized, you know, they kept it relatively safe for the most part. But um, I think there's a little bit more of the, the the ego, I would say, here in the organization that I haven't really seen. I would say in you know another in in America, I would say, but America's bigger, so it's tough to compare. Um, where have you seen it maybe done a little bit better, or do you think that um, there are places that are doing it better than others in certain countries? Well, you know, in Africa, our brothers and sisters may have an ethnic ego a nationality yeah. ego. I don't like to use the word tribe because it's actually of racist origin, but 
the ethnic kingdoms of Africa, they definitely have eagles attached to their ethnic kingdoms. But that's not race. Race mm. is when you hold our biological and ancestral identity superior to every other identity, which is obviously the philosophy of the Honorable Marcus Garvey to put the race first, you know? And so in Africa, even after all of the slavery we've been through and all of the colonization that we've been through, many, not all, many of our African brothers and sisters, they are still more tribalist than they are pan-Africanist. You know, that tribal ego is still greater than the racial ego. And of course, as pan-Africanists, we do not advocate that you eliminate your identity to your kingdom. There's nothing wrong with the Puerto Rican being proud to be Puerto Rican or being proud to be Latino. There's nothing wrong with the Yoruba of Nigeria or the Igbo of Nigeria or the Hausa of Nigeria or the Mandingo of Nigeria. There's nothing wrong with them being proud of their ethnicity. The issue is to hold your racial group membership more superior than the tribal or the or the ethnic rather and that's something that we as black people can't do we can't do it in africa we can't do it in the caribbean we can't do it here you know in america many of us don't know but we come from directly on the continent and so religion replaces the ethnic tribalism or the ethnic loyalty of africa in america that becomes a religious loyalty so being a muslim is more important than being an african being a christian is more important than being an African. And that's why we lose. Because for us, race is not, you know, race is not king. Religion is king, you know? And until race becomes king, we'll never come out of this, you know? Because mm -hmm. as long as people think you have to believe as I believe and pray as I pray in order for me to work with you, that means your religion becomes the enemy of black people, you know? So we have to forge an African family first consciousness. Until we forge an African family first continent consciousness, we will never organize. Africa will never get organized as long as religion is king. Black America and the Caribbean will never get organized as long as religion is king. And that holds true for Europe, that holds true for Asia, that holds true for African brothers and sisters in Australia, the South Pacific, Canada, you know, and uh, Central and South America. You know, we have to change our mind change your mind you change your world and black people are not yet ready to change the way we think and operate yeah i think uh i would i would agree with that like you you've definitely helped me re rethink and re uh re-solidify my perspective on how i see people that are also of african origin i mean uh, from but kind of one for one some people still don't think unfortunately that their ancestry is african if they're here they they've you know, they don't want to identify with that. So there's, that adds a little bit of complication. I mean, obviously I know the truth, but you know, you don't want to be like, oh, we're brothers. And then they say, oh, well, I'm not really from there. I'm this, and I respect it. But uh, the other thing that I was going to, that I was going to talk about is um, like in Ethiopia, for example, there's a lot of intertribal, you know, warfare right now. You know, they're, you know, the Mars, the, the Tigres, the, you know, all these different tribes. And for me, I'm looking at it like, you know, I'm first generation out. So I look at it a little bit different. I'm like, I didn't even know what tribe I was until maybe, you know, a year ago, right? So for me, Ethiopian is Ethiopian. But for me, I even got to look at it in a bigger sense where I'm African. I, I look out for my, my brothers and sisters. So I guess, like, what do you think about, I know you've talked a little bit about it, but what are your thoughts on people that are like, okay, well, I'm African, but I'm also kind of not. Like, how do I kind of come together with, with people that are of African but may not even recognize it? Well, that's that same issue of the unwillingness to subvert ethnic loyalty to racial loyalty. And you got to remember with Africa being the oldest continent on earth, uh, the people that is, uh, we lived on the planet alone. There were no other races. So from a historical perspective, I could, to some extent, understand why it can be so difficult to put race consciousness above ethnic consciousness or nationality consciousness, because for so long, there were only Africans in the world. So the only thing that mattered was your ethnic identity. But ever since we traveled out of the continent and other races began to evolve from us, 
you know, they're come and, and we, you know, come to realize that these races who evolved from us are hostile towards us. There becomes a need for the original people to organize themselves against these threats that are being posed to them by outside groups. So, you know, intelligence is the ability to adapt to your reality and solve new problems as they are created for you. So it is a very non-intelligent thing for African people to not wake up to the reality that every other race on the planet is organized against the survival of African people. Every other group, they are all locked and in step with an agenda to de depopulate the world of African people. You know, even when we look at the BRICS situation, okay, they will destabilize the American dollar. All right. In the long term, there will be some benefit to that for Africa. But American Africans are going to suffer as a result of it, because when, whenever America catches a cold, black America catches the flu. So we need to brace for that. But guess what? Russia, India, China, do they care about African people? Of course not. At the end of the day, Russia has the same dream that America has. At the end of the day, China has the same dream that America has, and that is to colonize the resources of Africa, period. The agenda of all non-African empires is the same because everyone knows that in order to run this world, to be king of the planet Earth, you have to be the king colonizer of African resources. That's why America is scrambling as much as she is on African continent because whoever controls the minerals of Africa, especially the strategic minerals, meaning those necessary for the atomic weapons, like the uranium of Niger. In order to control this planet, you got to control those large uranium deposits and those other strategic minerals. You got to control those diamonds, the gold, the coltan, the oil, the gas. You got to control those non-renewable resources. And Africa has some of the largest untapped uh, deposits of such resources. So there's no getting around it. The world always has wanted something from Africa that they don't want to pay for. So even when we look at the coups on the continent, Guinea, in Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, those brothers leading those coups, and I hope that they are all sincere in what they're doing. And I pray that this is not a CIA operation to give the illusion that we have some true revolutionaries on the continent when the truth of the matter is they're simply doing this in the interest of the CIA. I hope they are sincere. And I'm only saying this because three of those four countries have African trained military. So some of these leaders were no doubt trained by the U.S. Army. And I haven't heard anything from any of them uh, about the AFRICOM base in their country. What is going to become of the AFRICOM base? Are you pushing AFRICOM out? Are you working with AFRICOM? What's going on? Did America finance you to overthrow the French so they can take over the resources? I don't know. You know What's AFRICOM? Af AFRICOM Command uh, is a military initiative that was made popular by Barack Obama. It pre-existed him, but he made it popular. He made it successful. They uh, put African military bases on the African continent. Uh, I forget how many bases there are. I think there's at least 20. There may be as many as 40. U.S. military bases throughout Africa in strategic areas. And over the past uh, year and a half, you've had about eight coups. And if I'm not mistaken, every coup or nearly every coup that has happened in Africa over the past 18 months was in a country where the military was trained by the U.S. Army. So to my point, with three of these four, you know, revolutionary countries having African bases, I have to ask you know, what is your relationship with AFRICOM and what are your plans for the AFRICOM base in your country? I don't think none of the leaders have spoken to that. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the, the the more I kind of research it is, is it sounds like African countries like doing business more with Russia and China because of how well on the face they're being treated because they're not doing what the U.S. has done historically and affected their elections. However, what does that really mean? I mean, I'm sure all of them have the same goals, as you said. Uh, do you think that it's wise to, you know, take resources, loans, obviously, depending on the terms from these countries that may 
be treating these African countries more humane? Or do you just say, look, it's going to be ugly, but Africans got to do what's best for Africans and kind of keeping these, these, uh, these larger countries out of it? You got to keep them larger countries out of it because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. Russians are still white supremacists and they don't want to see Africa rise. You know, and what we know about racism is no matter how much white people may disagree with each other, when it comes to dealing with a mutual enemy such as African empowerment, they will work together. Montgomery brawl. So Africa has to be uh, careful. They have to be careful. My enemy's enemy is not my friend. You know, so I'm, you know, here, here's the bottom line. The reason it takes Africa so long to do what Africa needs to do is because you need leadership that is willing to be unpopular with its people, which I know is dangerous. It's politically dangerous. It's militaristically dangerous. It's socially dangerous because you need to be in good standing with your people to remain popular. But guess what? In order to be an effective president in Africa, you have to tell the people what they don't want to hear. The next four years is going to be a struggle. Why? Because we have to eliminate our dependency on foreign investment and we have to eliminate our dependency on uh, loans and handouts from opportunistic non-African governments. That means you're going to have to struggle. That means prices may go up a little bit. That means we may suffer from an increase in poverty in the, in, in the short term to save us in the long term. And the reason why a lot of African presidents have not said that to their people is they understand, just like here in America, black people are very much short-sighted and very much concerned about themselves. They only care about their comfort. We don't live for our grandchildren's grandchildren. If we live for our grandchildren's grandchildren, you know, if we had to suffer for the next five or 10 years so we could ultimately be in a better place, but not be alive to experience it ourselves, it wouldn't be a problem. But because we are so selfish, you know, so monolithic in our thinking, we only care about what we're going to benefit from right now. And because of that, it's hard for African presidents to tell black people or even American African leaders to tell black people, listen, things are going to get tough before they get better, but it's the only way we're going to ultimately eliminate our dependence on these foreign powers. Who wants to hear that? If you don't have a racial ego, if you don't have a racial identity, you don't want to hear anything about suffering for the greater good of African people, suffering for the greater good of black humanity. You don't want to hear that because you don't care about black humanity. You were never t raised by your parents to be loyal to black humanity. You were raised to care about you and your family and maybe those who belong to your religion. That's it. And that right there is the crucible of the global African predicament. We do not live for tomorrow. We don't live for our race. We live for ourselves. Selfishness is at the heart and soul of the 21st century oppression of African people. Mm. Yeah, and it's, I think it's happening kind of on, on on all fronts, right? Like the power base. I mean, the, the American culture is very, you know, even racist side is very kind of independent. Look out for myself, you know, kind of, I don't even know my neighbors type of, you know, vibe. And the, the they obviously want to attack the the solid black home with, you know, all of these different, uh, different I guess, like kind of propaganda. Like how, how, do, you, how do you think... Cause I always look at these channels, like a lot of Instagram, Facebook, YouTube channels. Like I always think depending on certain things that they post now, it's being more obvious. Like how many of these kind of like the shade room and like these, these popular kind of, uh, black accounts, I guess that I follow, like how many of those are kind of controlled by those people? If we can't even, all of them. If we can't all of them, they, they have to monitor social media because social media has decentralized communication and information. Unfortunately, black people don't use social media as a revolutionary instrument. You know, if you go through black Twitter, black YouTube, black TikTok, black Instagram, it's mostly foolishness, comedy, yeah. slander, uh, celebrity gossip. You know, if we were serious, every YouTube page in black space would be discussing a major issue trying to solve a major problem. Could you imagine going through Twitter or YouTube and every single platform was dedicated to some aspect of the global African liberation struggle? Just think about that for a minute. Like if you are going to get involved in any conversation, if you're going to get on Clubhouse for a conversation, it's going to be a serious one about a major problem we have. It might be a psychological issue. It might be a 
political, it might be economic, it might be spiritual, but it's something constructive. 95% of all black social media is destructive. 95% mm. of it, it is literally destructive. So we actually have a free platform. You don't even have to pay for it. You have the ability to communicate with African people throughout the world for free. And you do not use that to your advantage. I think that speaks to the psychological holocaust amongst African people. And I have to raise the psychological holocaust because we keep talking about the physical holocaust, meaning the ma'afa, the slavery. But guess what? The psychological holocaust has not ended. The physical part is over. The psychological part is still here. Every problem we suffer from, we suffer from because of our debilitated African consciousness and our debilitated African mindset. Why do you have so many different American African identities? Why? You might have more American African identities than you actually have ethnic nationalities in any single African country. That's how many different racial identities. You know why? Because nobody wants to be black. And everybody's mm -hmm. looking for a way to reduce their blackness because they think it improves their opportunities. This is why you got mm -hmm. American Africans claiming to be Native Americans more than African. You have American Africans claiming to be aliens. You have American Africans claiming to have not come from Africa. You have American Africans claiming that they're from Asia, not Africa. All of this nonsense that has been biologically genetically, anthropologically proven to be incorrect, but yet they stick to these identities because nobody wants to be black. Everybody's trying to escape their race because they think escaping blackness is the only way to vindicate themselves. We don't believe that there is hope for us as black people. Yeah, <clears throat> it's funny, the psychological thing. What's funny is the... When I first got here in, in Israel, the the type of content that I noticed that Israeli black people were making is similar to the content that American black people are making, which just goes to tell me that this is like a global thing, whether it's like intentional or, you know, obviously America influences a lot of things, but they see, OK, someone that's looking looks like me, that's got all this money, that's got all this fame, you know, let me start acting like them. And um, yeah, I just like, what What do you think can be done to kind of help that or like on a practical perspective, how can we start to, because it does get clicks, right? Like a lot of the de degeneracy gets clicks. Well, that's so how, how do we- That's the problem. Yeah. People are thirsty for views. They are thirsty for clicks, thirsty for likes, thirsty for subscribers, thirsty for content, and thirsty for the money that they get paid from social media. Unfortunately, social media has turned the world, children in particular, and in America, American African children in particular, because we our children are the, are the least supervised of all children in America because they are the most raised by single parents who have to work. Mm. So they're the least supervised children. So black children are more dependent and more controlled by social media than any other child in America. And, you know, unfortunately, Unfortunately, because of that, we're raising a generation of baby narcissists. Narcissism mm -hmm. is worth more than money. Attention is worth more than views now. The new currency is attention. And people will do anything to be seen, anything to get views, anything to get clicks. These YouTubers you see, at one time, I thought that they were addicted to the money that they were making. And they do make a pretty good dollar from what I understand. But you know what? I think it's the attention that they are more addicted to than the money. Because even if you watch some of these YouTubers, when they get demonetized, for whatever reason, when they get demonetized, they still produce just as much content. So money wasn't the main motive for their YouTube addiction. It was the narcissism. It, it was the attention. So, so social media has turned our children into a generation of narcissists. And it's turned many of our girls into a generation of promiscuous young ladies because the women, you know, are using their sex to get their views and their clicks and their likes, you know, and you see everything from little girls to grandmamas trying to exploit their sexuality for clickbait, you know, and I think it speaks to the fact that black people come from homes and backgrounds where they never got a lot of attention. 
Okay, a lot of us have that thirst for validation of the men as well as the women. And because we never got it in real time, we are now artificially artificially uh, replacing that in social media space. You know, so the more I look at this social media narcissism, the more the childhood psychological unmet needs of our people are manifesting themselves, you know, before my eyes. Uh, you know, if we're not going to use social media as a revolutionary tool, I wish it could be done away with. If I was in charge, because black mm. people are not using it, they're not weaponizing <laughs> social media for our own benefit, I would do away with it. We would be better off if tomorrow they announced that social media was illegal, I would be happy. Mm, I would wow. be, in, in okay. China, you know, they're not allowed on social media. They have their own form of yeah. social media in China. You know, in order to break through and get the YouTube and things like that, you have to have a VPN that that, yeah. that is kind of untraceable. When I go to Asia, I have to, you know, download a VPN in order to get on YouTube and things like that. You know why? Because the Chinese understand how important it is to control or protect the minds of their children. They understand it. And that's why they limited it. They even passed the rule that there's not going to be no uh, no same sex advertising, I believe, on their on their media. Because they understand America's propaganda has made America king. And they also understand from Mao Zedong's example that they can create their own propaganda. So the Chinese are very much unapologetically about making sure their children stay loyal to China. They are the exact opposite of black America. The, Ch the way the Chinese raise and cultivate the minds of their children is in direct contradiction to the way black America does it. We don't control nothing our children have access to. We let them watch anything, listen to everything, be around anybody. We let them go to schools where, you know, all types of anti-African lifestyles are being propagated and promulgated. We have no disciplinary control over our children whatsoever. And to your point, the way we fix this is we have to build our own schools. We have to build our own socialization process. You're never going to get an African and definitely not a generation of Africans who think, feel, and behave the way we need them to until you grow them. You have to grow them. You have to raise them. You have to make them. We need 20 years of progressive African child development, 20 years of it, and we can fix our problems. But in order to do that, you got to build your own schools. Black America is not about that life. If there's one thing slavery stole from black America, slavery stripped us down to the bones when it comes to taking financial responsibility for your own reality. Slavery stripped that out of the black man and the black woman. Black people in America don't wanna hear nothing about personal collective responsibility. Uh-uh, no, do not entertain black America about building its own hospitals, they don't wanna hear it. Don't entertain black America about building its own schools, they don't wanna hear it. Don't entertain black America about building its own banks, its own supermarkets, its own manufacturing, its own distribution, its own community security. Black America don't want to hear anything about collective financial responsibility. We are allergic to it. We hate the conversation. We will stop you in your tracks, which means what? We're a bunch of hypocrites. There's no need to talk about black power until you're going to organize and galvanize the black dollar. Until we organize and galvanize the black dollar, there is no black power. Black people know it but they don't want to talk about it. The quickest way to get black people out of your home is to bring up a conversation about using our money to solve our problems. Black people don't want to hear it. They will vote. They will march. They will protest. They are not going to spend themselves into liberation. Forget it. My hair is too important. My Air Jordans are too important. My snow bunny is too important. My car is too important. My clothing is, my son's football is too important. My daughter's volleyball is too important. Black people got a hundred priorities that supersede freedom, justice, and liberty. And that's why we will stay exactly where we are. Because as Frederick Douglass said, quote, he who is whipped the easiest will be whipped the most. Wow. Yeah, I was thinking about, like, you know, for me, I'm coming in, we, we immigrated to America. But, you know, the, the amount of money, time, and attention people dedicate into sports, something that the probability of you going and making making that a profitable endeavor at the next level and the fact that it ends at age you know 40 or whatever it may be or th even earlier 30 um it's just such a it's just not a wise allocation of resources like i just i've never really you know understood that but 
And I think it's something that is an easy transition of like, hey, I know you want to do the the private lessons. I know you want to do the uh, the AAU. I know you want to do this and that. But why don't you, you know, have that kid get a good head head on their shoulders, a, a school that you know what they're about, that you know what uh what what they're teaching your kid. Um, it's funny because a, a bad school can do a lot of damage. Like for me, when I was growing up, I I was one of those kids that they said, you know, it was a white lady, obviously, because they they teach and they just, she didn't understand me, didn't understand my energy level, my my aggression. You know, I wasn't violent or anything. I was just a, a boy, right? And they said, you you know, your son, he's ADHD. He needs to do this and that. And, you know, but my dad was there and he said, nah, like that, that's not going to happen. And, you know, for me, I was just kind of confused, didn't know what was going on. They tried it again. So I just, I think that there's definitely a lot of uh, a work work that needs to be done. Like for, for, I guess, people that may not have the money to send their kids to private school, do you recommend homeschooling or do you, is there some way to vet a potential school to make sure that, you know, one, they're good and, or two, they're not, you know, feeding your kid anything that's destructive to their self-esteem? Homeschooling is good if you can afford to do it. You know, my problem with black people, especially in the American context, the European context, the Canadian context, you know, those of us who live in predominantly non-African societies, you know, the, 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 the problem is most of our kids are raised by single mothers who got to work, you know, mm. so it can't, homeschooling can't be a solution because most black single mothers can't afford to do it. And the community isn't organized to help them do it. So how are they going to homeschool their children when they have so much responsibility towards protecting and providing for those children? It's not realistic, you know, so that's one thing. So homeschooling is a band-aid. If you're talking about systemic solution okay because for me if it's not systemic it's not a solution you know so mm -hmm. homeschooling will work for one family not for another okay systemically that's a band-aid because it doesn't benefit us as a people it only benefits those who are able to do it right it's like the school voucher system right you got some school districts who have a voucher you could they give you five thousand dollars take that five thousand dollars and apply it to any private school independent school you want well, guess what? If tuition is $20,000 and you're a single mom with three kids and the public school gives you $5,000 a kid, that's 15 grand. But your tuition is 60. Where are you going to get the other 45,000? It's not a solution. Yeah. Right. The solution is for us to build schools for our children, because the number one, one of the most important things we got to do for our children is socialize them, which means teach them how to work together and to work for African liberation. You can't do that if every child is being educated in an isolated home, right? So you got 20 kids on the same mm. block, but they all being homeschooled in the house. They don't know each other. They don't work with each other. They're not taught how to get along with each other. If black people have an issue relating to one another, right? Disorganization is a curse amongst our people. So to break the curse, you got to teach our children how to work together. How are you going to do that if every child is isolated in their own independent homeschooling box away from all the other children who are isolated in their own independent homeschooling box.